Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 1st Psalm 138 verse 5 They will sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. The time when Christians begin to sing in the ways of the Lord is when they first lose their burden at the foot of the cross. Not even the songs of the angels seem so sweet as the first song of rapture which gushes from the inmost soul of the forgiven child of God. You know how John Bunyan describes it. He says, when poor pilgrim lost his burden at the cross, he gave three great leaps and went on his way singing, Blessed cross, blessed sepulchre, blessed rather be, the man that there was put to shame for me. Believer, do you recollect the day when your fetters fell off? Do you remember the place when Jesus met you and said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love? I have blotted out as a cloud thy transgressions, and as a thick cloud thy sins. They shall not be mentioned against thee any more forever. Oh, what a sweet season is that when Jesus takes away the pain of sin. When the Lord first pardoned my sin, I was so joyous that I could scarce refrain from dancing. I thought, on my road home from the house where I had been set at liberty, that I must tell the stones in the street the story of my deliverance. So full was my soul of joy that I wanted to tell every snowflake that was falling from heaven of the wondrous love of Jesus, who had blotted out the sins of one of the chief of rebels. But it is not only at the commencement of the Christian life that believers have reason for song. As long as they live, they discover cause to sing in the ways of the Lord, and their experience of His constant loving kindness leads them to say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. See to it, brother, that thou magnifiest the Lord this day. Long as we tread this desert land, new mercies shall new songs demand. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 1st 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26 I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were delightful to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Come, dear readers, let each one of us speak for himself of the wonderful love, not of Jonathan, but of Jesus. We will not relate what we have been told, but the things which we have tasted and handled of the love of Christ. Thy love to me, O Jesus, was wonderful when I was a stranger wandering far from thee, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Thy love restrained me from committing the sin which is unto death, and withheld me from self-destruction. Thy love held back the axe when justice said, Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Thy love drew me into the wilderness, stripped me there, and made me feel the guilt of my sin, and the burden of mine iniquity. Thy love spake thus comfortably to me when, I was sore dismayed. Come unto me, and I will give thee rest. Oh, how matchless thy love, when, in a moment, thou didst wash my sins away, and make my polluted soul, which was crimson with the blood of my nativity, and black with the grime of my transgressions, to be white as the driven snow, and pure as the finest wool. How thou didst commend thy love when thou didst whisper in my ears, I am thine, and thou art mine. Kind were those accents when thou saidst, The Father himself loveth you. And sweet the moments, passing sweet, when thou declaredst to me the love of the Spirit. Never shall my soul forget those chambers of fellowship where thou hast unveiled thyself to me. Had Moses his cleft in the rock, where he saw the train, the back parts of his God. We, too, have had our clefts in the rock, where we have seen the full splendors of the Godhead in the person of Christ. Did David remember the tracks of the wild goat, 
the land of Jordan and the Hermonites? We too can remember spots to memory dear, equal to these in blessedness. Precious Lord Jesus, give us a fresh draft of thy wondrous love to begin the month with. Amen. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 2nd Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 According to the law, in fact, nearly everything must be purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. This is the voice of unalterable truth. In none of the Jewish ceremonies were sins, even typically, removed without blood shedding. In no case, by no means can sin be pardoned without atonement. It is clear, then, that there is no hope for me out of Christ, for there is no other blood shedding which is worth a thought as an atonement for sin. Am I, then, believing in him? Is the blood of his atonement truly applied to my soul? All men are on a level as to their need of him. If we be never so moral, generous, amiable, or patriotic, the rule will not be altered to make an exception for us. Sin will yield to nothing less potent than the blood of him whom God hath set forth as a propitiation. What a blessing that there is the one way of pardon. Why should we seek another? Persons of merely formal religion cannot understand how we can rejoice that all our sins are forgiven us for Christ's sake. Their works and prayers and ceremonies give them very poor comfort, and well may they be uneasy, for they are neglecting the one great salvation and endeavouring to get remission without blood. My soul, sit down, and behold the justice of God as bound to punish sin. See that punishment all executed upon thy Lord Jesus, and fall down in humble joy and kiss the dear feet of him whose blood has made atonement for thee. It is in vain when conscience is aroused to fly to feelings and evidences for comfort. This is a habit which we learned in the Egypt of our legal bondage. The only restorative for a guilty conscience is a sight of Jesus suffering on the cross. The blood is the life thereof, says the Levitical law, and let us rest assured that it is the life of faith and joy and every other holy grace. Oh, how sweet to view the flowing of my Saviour's precious blood, with divine assurance knowing he has made my peace with God. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 2nd 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 22 Jochim, the men of Koziba and Joash and Saraph, who ruled in Moab and Jashubilehem. These names are from ancient records. Yet not so ancient as those precious things which are the delight of our souls. Let us for a moment recount them, telling them over as misers count their gold. The sovereign choice of the Father by which he elected us unto eternal life, or ever the earth was, is a matter of vast antiquity, since no date can be conceived for it by the mind of man. We were chosen from before the foundations of the world. Everlasting love went with the choice, for it was not a bare act of divine will by which we were set apart, but the divine affections were concerned. The Father loved us in and from the beginning. Here is a theme for daily contemplation. The eternal purpose to redeem us from our foreseen ruin, to cleanse and sanctify us, and at last to glorify us, was of infinite antiquity, and runs side by side with immutable love and absolute sovereignty. The covenant is always described as being everlasting, and Jesus, the second party in it, had his goings forth of old. He struck hands in sacred suretyship long ere the first of the stars began to shine, and it was in him that the elect were ordained unto eternal life. Thus, in the divine purpose 
a most blessed covenant union was established between the Son of God and His elect people, which will remain as the foundation of their safety when time shall be no more. Is it not well to be conversant with these ancient things? Is it not shameful that they should be so much neglected and even rejected by the bulk of professors? If they knew more of their own sin, would they not be more ready to adore distinguishing grace? Let us both admire and adore tonight, as we sing. A monument of grace, a sinner saved by blood, the streams of love I trace, up to the fountain God, and in his sacred bosom see, eternal thoughts of love to me. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 3rd Romans chapter 8, verse 12 Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. As God's creatures, we are all debtors to Him, to obey Him with all our body and soul and strength. Having broken His commandments, as we all have, we are debtors to His justice, and we owe to Him a vast amount which we are not able to pay. But of the Christian, it can be said that he does not owe God's justice anything, for Christ has paid the debt his people owed. For this reason, the believer owes the more to love. I am a debtor to God's grace and forgiving mercy, but I am no debtor to his justice, for he will never accuse me of a debt already paid. Christ said, It is finished and by that he meant that whatever his people owed was wiped away forever from the book of remembrance. Christ, to the uttermost, has satisfied divine justice. The account is settled, the handwriting is nailed to the cross, the receipt is given, and we are debtors to God's justice no longer. But then, because we are not debtors to our Lord in that sense, we become ten times more debtors to God than we should have been otherwise. Christian, pause and ponder for a moment. What a debtor thou art to divine sovereignty! How much thou owest to his disinterested love, for he gave his own Son that he might die for thee! Consider how much you owe to his forgiving grace, that after ten thousand affronts he loves you as infinitely as ever. Consider what you owe to his power, how he has raised you from your death in sin, how he has preserved your spiritual life, how he has kept you from falling, and how, though a thousand enemies have beset your path, you have been able to hold on your way. Consider what you owe to his immutability. Though you have changed a thousand times, he has not changed once. Thou art as deep in debt as thou canst be to every attribute of God. To God thou owest thyself, and all thou hast. Yield thyself as a living sacrifice, it is but thy reasonable service. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 3rd Song of Solomon, Chapter 1, Verse 7 Tell me, O one I love, where do you pasture your sheep? Where do you rest them at midday? Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your companions? These words express the desire of the believer after Christ and his longing for present communion with him. Where dost thou feed thy flock? In thy house? I will go, if I may find thee there. In private prayer? Then I will pray without ceasing. In the Word? Then I will read it diligently. In thine ordinances? Then I will walk in them with all my heart. Tell me where thou feedest, for wherever thou standest as the shepherd, there will I lie down as a sheep, for none but thyself can supply my need. I cannot be satisfied to be apart from thee. My soul hungers and thirsts for the refreshment of thy presence. Where dost thou make thy flock to rest at noon? For whether at dawn or at noon, my only rest must be where thou art and thy beloved flock. My soul's rest must be a grace-given rest, 
and can only be found in thee. Where is the shadow of that rock? Why should I not repose beneath it? Why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Thou hast companions. Why should I not be one? Satan tells me I am unworthy, but I always was unworthy, and yet thou hast long loved me, and therefore my unworthiness cannot be a bar to my having fellowship with thee now. It is true I am weak in faith, and prone to fall, but my very feebleness is the reason why I should always be where thou feedest thy flock, that I may be strengthened and preserved in safety beside the still waters. Why should I turn aside? There is no reason why I should, but there are a thousand reasons why I should not, for Jesus beckons me to come. If he withdrew himself a little, it is but to make me prize his presence more. Now that I am grieved and distressed at being away from him, he will lead me yet again to that sheltered nook, where the lambs of his fold are sheltered from the burning sun. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 4th Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 Then the Lord said to me, Go show love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love to offer raisin cakes to idols. Believer, look back through all thine experience and think of the way whereby the Lord thy God has led thee in the wilderness and how he hath fed and clothed thee every day, how he hath borne with thine ill manners how he hath put up with all thy murmurings and all thy longings after the flesh pots of Egypt, how he has opened the rock to supply thee and fed thee with manna that came down from heaven. Think of how his grace has been sufficient for thee in all thy troubles, how his blood has been a pardon to thee in all thy sins, how his rod and his staff have comforted thee. When thou hast thus Looked back upon the love of the Lord, then let faith survey his love in the future. For remember that Christ's covenant and blood have something more in them than the past. He who has loved thee and pardoned thee shall never cease to love and pardon. He is Alpha, and he shall be Omega also. He is first, and he shall be last. Therefore, bethink thee. When thou shalt pass through the valley of the shadow of death, thou needest fear no evil, for he is with thee. When thou shalt stand in the cold floods of Jordan, thou needest not fear, for death cannot separate thee from his love. And when thou shalt come into the mysteries of eternity, thou needest not tremble. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, soul, is not thy love refreshed? Does not this make thee love Jesus? Doth not a flight through illimitable plains of the ether of love inflame thy heart? and compel thee to delight thyself in the Lord thy God. Surely as we meditate on the love of the Lord, our hearts burn within us, and we long to love him more. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 4th Joshua chapter 20 verse 3 So that anyone who kills another, unintentionally or accidentally, may flee there. These will be your refuge from the avenger of blood. It is said that in the land of Canaan, cities of refuge were so arranged that any man might reach one of them within half a day at the utmost. Even so, the word of our salvation is near to us. Jesus is a present Saviour, and the way to him is short. It is but a simple renunciation of our own merit and a laying hold of Jesus to be our all in all. 
With regard to the roads to the city of refuge, we are told that they were strictly preserved. Every river was bridged, and every obstruction removed, so that the man who fled might find an easy passage to the city. Once a year the elders went along the roads and saw to their order, so that nothing might impede the flight of anyone, and cause him, through delay, to be overtaken and slain. How graciously do the promises of the gospel remove stumbling blocks from the way. Wherever there were byroads and turnings, there were fixed up handposts with the inscription upon them, To the City of Refuge. This is a picture of the road to Christ Jesus. It is no roundabout road of the law. It is no obeying this, that, and the other. It is a straight road. Believe and live. It is a road so hard that no self-righteous man can ever tread it, but so easy that every sinner who knows himself to be a sinner may by it find his way to heaven. No sooner did the manslayer reach the outworks of the city than he was safe. It was not necessary for him to pass far within the walls, but the suburbs themselves were sufficient protection. Learn hence that if you do but touch the hem of Christ's garment, you shall be made whole. If you do but lay hold upon him with faith as a grain of mustard seed, you are safe. A little genuine grace ensures the death of all our sins. Only waste no time, loiter not by the way, for the avenger of blood is swift of foot, and it may be he is at your heels at this still hour of eventide. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 5th 1 John, chapter 4, verse 14 And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Saviour of the world. It is a sweet thought that Jesus Christ did not come forth without His Father's permission, authority, consent, and assistance. He was sent of the Father, that He might be the Saviour of men. We are too apt to forget that, while there are distinctions as to the persons in the Trinity, there are no distinctions of honor. We too frequently ascribe the honor of our salvation, or at least the depths of its benevolence, more to Jesus Christ than we do the Father. This is a very great mistake. What if Jesus came? Did not his Father send him? If he spake wondrously, did not his Father pour grace into his lips? that he might be an able minister of the new covenant? He who knoweth the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as he should know them, never setteth one before another in his love. He sees them at Bethlehem, at Gethsemane, and on Calvary, all equally engaged in the work of salvation. O Christian, hast thou put thy confidence in the man Christ Jesus? Hast thou placed thy reliance solely on him? And art thou united with him? Then believe that thou art united unto the God of heaven. Since to the man Christ Jesus thou art brother, and holdest closest fellowship, thou art linked thereby with God the Eternal, and the Ancient of Days is thy father and thy friend. Didst thou ever consider the depth of love in the heart of Jehovah, when God the Father equipped his Son for the great enterprise of mercy? If not, be this thy day's meditation. The Father sent him. Contemplate that subject. Think how Jesus works what the Father wills. In the wounds of the dying Savior, see the love of the great I Am. Let every thought of Jesus be also connected with the eternal, ever-blessed God, for it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 5th Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 At that time Jesus declared, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. This is a singular way in which to commence a verse. 
At that time, Jesus answered, If you will look at the context, you will not perceive that any person had asked him a question, or that he was in conversation with any human being. Yet it is written, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father. When a man answers, he answers a person who has been speaking to him. Who, then, had spoken to Christ, his Father? Yet there is no record of it, and this should teach us that Jesus had constant fellowship with his Father, and that God spake into his heart so often, so continually, that it was not a circumstance singular enough to be recorded. It was the habit and life of Jesus to talk with God. Even as Jesus was, in this world, so are we. Let us therefore learn the lesson which this simple statement concerning Him teaches us. May we likewise have silent fellowship with the Father, so that often we may answer Him. And though the world wotteth not to whom we speak, may we be responding to that secret voice unheard of any other ear, which our own ear, opened by the Spirit of God, recognizes with joy. God has spoken to us. Let us speak to God, either to set our seal that God is true and faithful to His promise, or to confess the sin of which the Spirit of God has convinced us, or to acknowledge the mercy which God's providence has given, or to express assent to the great truths which God the Holy Ghost has opened to our understanding. What a privilege is intimate communion with the Father of our spirits. It is a secret hidden from the world, a joy with which even the nearest friend intermeddleth not. If we would hear the whispers of God's love, our ear must be purged and fitted to listen to His voice. This very evening may our hearts be in such a state that when God speaks to us, we, like Jesus, may be prepared at once to answer Him. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 6th Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 Pray in the Spirit at all times, with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert, with all perseverance, in your prayers for all the saints. What multitudes of prayers we have put up from the first moment when we learned to pray. Our first prayer was a prayer for ourselves. We asked that God would have mercy upon us and blot out our sin. He heard us, but when He had blotted out our sins like a cloud, then we had more prayers for ourselves. We have had to pray for sanctifying grace, for constraining and restraining grace. We have been led to crave for a fresh assurance of faith, for the comfortable application of the promise, for deliverance in the hour of temptation, for help in the time of duty, and for succor in the day of trial. We have been compelled to go to God for our souls, as constant beggars asking for everything. Bear witness, children of God, you have never been able to get anything for your souls elsewhere. All the bread your soul has eaten has come down from heaven, and all the water of which it has drank has flowed from the living rock, Christ Jesus the Lord. Your soul has never grown rich in itself. It has always been a pensioner upon the daily bounty of God, and hence your prayers have ascended to heaven for a range of spiritual mercies all but infinite. Your wants were innumerable, and therefore the supplies have been infinitely great, and your prayers have been as varied as the mercies have been countless. Then, have you not cause to say, I love the Lord, because He hath heard the voice of my supplication? For as your prayers have been many, so also have been God's answers to them. He has heard you in the day of trouble, has strengthened you, and helped you, even when you dishonored Him by trembling and doubting at the mercy seat. Remember this, and let it fill your heart with gratitude to God who has thus graciously heard your poor weak prayers. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Morning and Evening Devotional 
by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Evening, February 6th. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power to prevail. As an encouragement cheerfully to offer intercessory prayer, remember that such prayer is the sweetest God ever hears, for the prayer of Christ is of this character. In all the incense which our great high priest now puts into the golden censer, there is not a single grain for himself. His intercession must be the most acceptable of all supplications, and the more like our prayer is to Christ's, the sweeter it will be. Thus, while petitions for ourselves will be accepted, our pleadings for others, having in them more of the fruits of the Spirit, more love, more faith, more brotherly kindness, will be, through the precious merits of Jesus, the sweetest oblation that we can offer to God, the very fat of our sacrifice. Remember, again, that intercessory prayer is exceedingly prevalent. What wonders it has wrought! The Word of God teems with its marvelous deeds. Believer, thou hast a mighty engine in thy hand. Use it well. Use it constantly. Use it with faith, and thou shalt surely be a benefactor to thy brethren. When thou hast the king's ear, speak to him for the suffering members of his body. When thou art favored to draw very near to his throne, and the king saith to thee, Ask, and I will give thee what thou wilt. Let thy petitions be, not for thyself alone, but for the many who need his aid. If thou hast grace at all, and art not an intercessor, that grace must be small as a grain of mustard seed. Thou hast just enough grace to float thy soul clear from the quicksand, but thou hast no deep floods of grace, or else thou wouldst carry in thy joyous bark a weighty cargo of the wants of others, and thou wouldst bring back from thy Lord for them rich blessings which but for thee they might not have obtained. O oh, let my hands forget their skill, my tongue be silent, cold, and still, this bounding heart forget to beat, if I forget the mercy seat. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 7th Micah chapter 2, verse 10 Arise and depart, for this is not your place of rest, because its defilement brings destruction, a grievous destruction. The hour is approaching when the message will come to us, as it comes to all. Arise, and go forth from the home in which thou hast dwelt, from the city in which thou hast done thy business, from thy family, from thy friends. Arise, and take thy last journey. And what know we of the journey? And what know we of the country to which we are bound? A little we have read thereof, and somewhat has been revealed to us by the Spirit. But how little do we know of the realms of the future! We know that there is a black and stormy river called Death. God bids us cross it, promising to be with us. And after death, what cometh? What wonder world will open upon our astonished sight? What scene of glory will be unfolded to our view? No traveller has ever returned to tell. But we know enough of the heavenly land to make us welcome our summons thither with joy and gladness. The journey of death may be dark, but we may go forth on it fearlessly, knowing that God is with us as we walk through the gloomy valley. And therefore, we need fear, no evil. We shall be departing from all we have known and loved here, but we shall be going to our Father's house, to our Father's home where Jesus is, to that royal city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This shall be our last removal, to dwell forever with him we love, in the midst of his people, in the presence of God. Christian, meditate much on heaven. It will help thee to press on, 
and to forget the toil of the way. This veil of tears is but the pathway to the better country. This world of woe is but the stepping stone to a world of bliss. Prepare us, Lord, by grace divine, for thy bright courts on high. Then bid our spirits rise and join the chorus of the sky. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 7th Revelation, chapter 11, verse 12 And the witnesses heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched them. Without considering these words in their prophetical connection, let us regard them as the invitation of our great forerunner to his sanctified people. In due time there shall be heard a great voice from heaven to every believer saying, Come up hither. This should be to the saints the subject of joyful anticipation, instead of dreading the time when we shall leave this world to go unto the Father. We should be panting for the hour of our emancipation. Our song should be, My heart is with him on his throne, and ill can brook delay, each moment listening for the voice. Rise up and come away. We are not called down to the grave, but up to the skies. Our heaven-born spirits should long for their native air. Yet should the celestial summons be the object of patient waiting. Our God knows best when to bid us come up hither. We must not wish to antedate the period of our departure. I know that strong love will make us cry. O Lord of hosts, the waves divide, and land us all in heaven. But patience must have her perfect work. God ordains with accurate wisdom the most fitting time for the redeemed to abide below. Surely, if there could be regrets in heaven, the saints might mourn that they did not live longer here to do more good. Oh, for more sheaves for my Lord's garner, more jewels for his crown. But how unless there be more work? True, there is the other side of it, that living so briefly, our sins are the fewer. But oh, when we are fully serving God, and he is giving us to scatter precious seed and reap a hundredfold, we would even say it is well for us to abide where we are. Whether our master shall say go or stay, let us be equally well pleased so long as he indulges us with his presence. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 8th Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When a person is dear, Everything connected with him becomes dear for his sake. Thus, so precious is the person of the Lord Jesus in the estimation of all true believers, that everything about him they consider to be inestimable beyond all price. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, said David, as if the very vestments of the Saviour were so sweetened by his person that he could not but love them. Certain it is that there is not a spot where that hallowed foot hath trodden. There is not a word which those blessed lips have uttered, nor a thought which his loving word has revealed, which is not to us precious beyond all price. And this is true of the names of Christ. They are all sweet in the believer's ear. Whether he be called the husband of the church, her bridegroom, her friend, whether he be styled the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the King, the Prophet, or the Priest, every title of our Master, Shiloh, Emmanuel, Wonderful, the Mighty Counselor, every name is like the honeycomb dropping with honey, and luscious are the drops that distill from it. But if there be one name sweeter than another in the believer's ear, it is the name of Jesus. Jesus. It is the name which moves the harps of heaven to melody. Jesus, the life of all our joys. 
If there be one name more charming, more precious than another, it is this name. It is woven into the very warp and woof of our psalmody. Many of our hymns begin with it, and scarcely any that are good for anything end without it. It is the sum total of all delights. It is the music with which the bells of heaven ring, a song in a word, an ocean for comprehension, although a drop for brevity, a matchless oratorio in two syllables, a gathering up of the hallelujahs of eternity in five letters. Jesus, I love thy charming name. Tis music to mine ear. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 8th Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Many persons, if they are asked what they understand by salvation, will reply, being saved from hell and taken to heaven. This is one result of salvation, but it is not one tithe of what is contained in that boon. It is true, our Lord Jesus Christ does redeem all his people from the wrath to come. He saves them from the fearful condemnation which their sins had brought upon them. But his triumph is far more complete than this. He saves his people from their sins. O oh, sweet deliverance from our worst foes! Where Christ works a saving work, he casts Satan from his throne and will not let him be master any longer. No man is a true Christian if sin reigns in his mortal body. Sin will be in us. It will never be utterly expelled till the Spirit enters glory, but it will never have dominion. There will be a striving for dominion, a lusting against the new law and the new spirit which God has implanted. But sin will never get the upper hand so as to be absolute monarch of our nature. Christ will be master of the heart, and sin must be mortified. The lion of the tribe of Judah shall prevail, and the dragon shall be cast out. Professor, is sin subdued in you? If your life is unholy, your heart is unchanged, and if your heart is unchanged, you are an unsaved person. If the Savior has not sanctified you, renewed you, given you a hatred of sin and a love of holiness, he has done nothing in you of a saving character. The grace which does not make a man better than others is a worthless counterfeit. Christ saves his people, not in their sins, but from them. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If not saved from sin, how shall we hope to be counted among his people? Lord, save me now from all evil, and enable me to honor my Savior. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 9th 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 23 so David inquired of the Lord, who answered, Do not march straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. When David made this inquiry, he had just fought the Philistines and gained a signal victory. The Philistines came up in great hosts, but by the help of God, David had easily put them to flight. Note, however, that when they came a second time, David did not go up to fight them without inquiring of the Lord. Once he had been victorious, and he might have said, as many have in other cases, I shall be victorious again. I may rest quite sure that if I have conquered once, I shall triumph yet again. Wherefore should I tarry to seek at the Lord's hands? Not so, David. He had gained one battle by the strength of the Lord. He would not venture upon another until he had ensured the same. He inquired, Shall I go up against them? He waited until God's sign was given. Learn from David to take no step without God. Christian, if thou wouldst know the path of duty, 
Take God for thy compass. If thou wouldst steer thy ship through the dark billows, put the tiller into the hand of the Almighty. Many a rock might be escaped if we would let our Father take the helm. Many a shoal or quicksand we might well avoid if we would leave to his sovereign will to choose and to command. The Puritan said, As sure as ever a Christian carves for himself, he'll cut his own fingers. This is a great truth. Said another old divine, He that goes before the cloud of God's providence goes on a fool's errand. And so he does. We must mark God's providence leading us. And if providence tarries, tarry till providence comes. He who goes before providence will be very glad to run back again. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, is God's promise to his people. Let us then take all our perplexities to him and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Leave not thy chamber this morning without inquiring of the Lord. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 9th Luke chapter 11 verse 4 And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. What we are taught to seek or shun in prayer, we should equally pursue or avoid in action. Very earnestly, therefore, should we avoid temptation seeking to walk so guardedly in the path of obedience that we may never tempt the devil to tempt us. We are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion. Dearly might we pay for such presumption. This lion may cross our path or leap upon us from the thicket, but we have nothing to do with hunting him. He that meeteth with him, even though he winneth the day, will find it a stern struggle. Let the Christian pray that he may be spared the encounter. Our Saviour, who had experience of what temptation meant, thus earnestly admonished his disciples, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. But let us do as we will, we shall be tempted. Hence the prayer, Deliver us from evil. God had one son without sin, but he has no son without temptation. The natural man, is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards, and the Christian man is born to temptation just as certainly. We must be always on our watch against Satan, because, like a thief, he gives no intimation of his approach. Believers who have had experience of the ways of Satan know that there are certain seasons when he will most probably make an attack just as at certain seasons bleak winds may be expected. Thus, the Christian is put on a double guard by fear of danger, and the danger is averted by preparing to meet it. Prevention is better than cure. It is better to be so well armed that the devil will not attack you than to endure the perils of the fight, even though you come off a conqueror. Pray this evening first that you may not be tempted, and next, that if temptation be permitted, you may be delivered from the evil one. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 10th Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 I know how to live humbly, and I know how to abound. In any and every situation I have learned the secret of being filled and being hungry, of having plenty, and having need. There are many who know how to be abased, who have not learned how to abound. When they are set upon the top of a pinnacle, their heads grow dizzy, and they are ready to fall. The Christian far oftener disgraces his profession in prosperity than in adversity. It is a dangerous thing to be prosperous. The crucible of adversity is a less severe trial to the Christian than the refining pot of prosperity. Oh, what leanness of soul and neglect of spiritual things have been brought on through the very mercies and bounties of God! Yet this is not a matter of necessity, 
For the apostle tells us that he knew how to abound. When he had much, he knew how to use it. Abundant grace enabled him to bear abundant prosperity. When he had a full sail, he was loaded with much ballast, and so floated safely. It needs more than human skill to carry the brimming cup of mortal joy with a steady hand. Yet Paul had learned that skill, for he declares, In all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. It is a divine lesson to know how to be full, for the Israelites were full once. But while the flesh was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them. Many have asked for mercies that they might satisfy their own heart's lust. Fullness of bread has often made fullness of blood, and that has brought on wantonness of spirit. When we have much of God's providential mercies, it often happens that we have but little of God's grace, and little gratitude for the bounties we have received. We are full, and we forget God. Satisfied with earth, we are content to do without heaven. Rest assured, it is harder to know how to be full than it is to know how to be hungry. So desperate is the tendency of human nature to pride and forgetfulness of God. Take care that you ask in your prayers that God would teach you how to be full. Let not the gifts thy love bestows estrange our hearts from thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 10th Isaiah chapter 44 verse 22 I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Attentively observe the instructive similitude. Our sins are like a cloud. As clouds are of many shapes and shades, so are our transgressions. As clouds obscure the light of the sun and darken the landscape beneath, so do our sins hide from us the light of Jehovah's face and cause us to sit in the shadow of death. They are earth-born things and rise from the miry places of our nature, and when so collected that their measure is full, they threaten us with storm and tempest. Alas, that unlike clouds, our sins yield us no genial showers, but rather threaten to deluge us with a fiery flood of destruction. O ye black clouds of sin, how can it be fair weather with our souls while ye remain? Let our joyful eye dwell upon the notable act of divine mercy, blotting out. God himself appears upon the scene, and in divine benignity, instead of manifesting his anger, reveals his grace. He at once and forever effectually removes the mischief, not by blowing away the cloud, but by blotting it out from existence once for all. Against the justified man, no sin remains. The great transaction of the cross has eternally removed his transgressions from him. On Calvary's summit, the great deed by which the sin of all the chosen was forever put away was completely and effectually performed. Practically let us obey the gracious command, Return unto me. Why should pardoned sinners live at a distance from their God? If we have been forgiven all our sins, let no legal fear withhold us from the boldest access to our Lord. Let backslidings be bemoaned, but let us not persevere in them. To the greatest possible nearness of communion with the Lord, let us, in the power of the Holy Spirit, strive mightily to return. O Lord, this night restore us. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 11th Acts chapter 4, verse 13 When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they marveled and took note that these men had been with Jesus. A Christian should be a striking likeness of Jesus Christ. You have read Lives of Christ, beautifully and eloquently written, but the best life of Christ is His living biography, written out in the words and actions of His people. 
If we were what we profess to be and what we should be, we should be pictures of Christ. Yea, such striking likenesses of him that the world would not have to hold us up by the hour together and say, well, it seems somewhat of a likeness. But they would, when they once beheld us, exclaim, He has been with Jesus. He has been taught of Him. He is like Him. He has caught the very idea of the holy man of Nazareth, and He works it out in His life and everyday actions. A Christian should be like Christ in His boldness. Never blush to own your religion. Your profession will never disgrace you. Take care you never disgrace that. Be like Jesus, very valiant for your God. Imitate him in your loving spirit. Think kindly, speak kindly, and do kindly, that men may say of you, He has been with Jesus. Imitate Jesus in his holiness. Was he zealous for his master? So be you. Ever go about doing good. Let not time be wasted, it is too precious. Was he self-denying, never looking to his own interest? Be the same. Was he devout? Be you fervent in your prayers. Had he deference to his father's will? So submit yourselves to him. Was he patient? So learn to endure. And best of all, as the highest portraiture of Jesus, try to forgive your enemies, as he did. And let those sublime words of your master, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, always ring in your ears. Forgive as you hope to be forgiven. Heap coals of fire on the head of your foe by your kindness to him. Good for evil, recollect, is godlike. Be godlike, then, and in all ways and by all means, so live that all may say of you, he has been with Jesus. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 11th Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4 But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Ever to be remembered is that best and brightest of ours, when first we saw the Lord, lost our burden received the role of promise, rejoiced in full salvation, and went on our way in peace. It was springtime in the soul. The winter was past. The mutterings of Sinai's thunders were hushed. The flashings of its lightnings were no more perceived. God was beheld as reconciled. The law threatened no vengeance. Justice demanded no punishment. Then the flowers appeared in our heart. Hope Love, peace, and patience sprung from the sod. The hyacinth of repentance, the snowdrop of pure holiness, the crocus of golden faith, the daffodil of early love, all decked the garden of the soul. The time of the singing of birds was come, and we rejoiced with thanksgiving. We magnified the holy name of our forgiving God, and our resolve was, Lord, I am thine. Wholly thine, all I am and all I have, I would devote to thee. Thou hast bought me with thy blood. Let me spend myself and be spent in thy service. In life and in death, let me be consecrated to thee. How have we kept this resolve? Our espousal love burned with a holy flame of devoutedness to Jesus. Is it the same now? Might not Jesus well say to us, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Alas, it is but little we have done for our master's glory. Our winter has lasted all too long. We are as cold as ice, when we should feel a summer's glow and bloom with sacred flowers. We give to God pence, when he deserveth pounds, nay, deserveth our heart's blood to be coined in the service of his church and of his truth. But shall we continue thus? O Lord, after thou hast so richly blessed us, shall we be ungrateful, and become indifferent to thy good cause and work? O quicken us that we may return to our first love, and do our first works. Send us a genial spring, O Son of Righteousness.
Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Morning, February 12th, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. There is a blessed proportion. The ruler of providence bears a pair of scales. In this side he puts his people's trials, and in that he puts their consolations. When the scale of trial is nearly empty, you will always find the scale of consolation in nearly the same condition. And when the scale of trials is full, you will find the scale of consolation just as heavy. When the black clouds gather most, the light is the more brightly revealed to us. When the night lowers and the tempest is coming on, the heavenly captain is always closest to his crew. It is a blessed thing that when we are most cast down, then it is that we are most lifted up by the consolations of the Spirit. One reason is because trials make more room for consolation. Great hearts can only be made by great troubles. The spade of trouble digs the reservoir of comfort deeper and makes more room for consolation. God comes into our heart. He finds it full. He begins to break our comforts and to make it empty. Then there is more room for grace. The humbler a man lies, the more comfort he will always have, because he will be more fitted to receive it. Another reason why we are often most happy in our troubles is this. Then we have the closest dealings with God. When the barn is full, man can live without God. When the purse is bursting with gold, we try to do without so much prayer. But once take our gourds away, and we want our God, once cleanse the idols out of the house, then we are compelled to honor Jehovah. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. There is no cry so good as that which comes from the bottom of the mountains, no prayer half so hearty as that which comes up from the depths of the soul through deep trials and afflictions. Hence they bring us to God, and we are happier. For nearness to God is happiness. Come, troubled believer, fret not over your heavy troubles, for they are the heralds of weighty mercies. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 12th John chapter 14 verse 16 And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The great Father revealed Himself to believers of old, before the coming of His Son, and was known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the God Almighty. Then Jesus came, and the ever-blessed Son in His own proper person was the delight of His people's eyes. At the time of the Redeemer's ascension, the Holy Spirit became the head of the present dispensation and His power was gloriously manifested in and after Pentecost. He remains at this hour the present Emmanuel, God with us, dwelling in and with His people, quickening, guiding, and ruling in their midst. Is His presence recognized as it ought to be? We cannot control His working. He is most sovereign in all His operations. But are we sufficiently anxious to obtain His help, or sufficiently watchful, lest we provoke Him to withdraw His aid. Without Him we can do nothing, but by His almighty energy the most extraordinary results can be produced. Everything depends upon His manifesting or concealing His power. Do we always look up to Him both for our inner life and our outward service? with the respectful dependence which is fitting? Do we not too often run before His call and act independently of His aid? Let us humble ourselves this evening for past neglects, and now entreat the heavenly dew to rest upon us, the sacred oil to anoint us, the celestial flame to burn within us. The Holy Ghost is no temporary gift. He abides with the saints. We have but to seek Him aright, and he will be found of us. He is jealous, but he is pitiful. If he leaves in anger, he returns in mercy. 
condescending and tender, he does not weary of us, but awaits to be gracious still. Sin has been hammering my heart. Unto a hardness, void of love, let supplying grace to cross his art drop from above. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 13th 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 2 Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when Christ appears, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us! Consider who we were and what we feel ourselves to be even now when corruption is powerful in us, and you will wonder at our adoption. Yet we are called the sons of God. What a high relationship is that of a son, and what privileges it brings! What care and tenderness the son expects from his father, and what love the father feels towards the son! But all that, and more than that, we now have through Christ. As for the temporary drawback of suffering with the elder brother, this we accept as an honour. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We are content to be unknown with him in his humiliation, for we are to be exalted with him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That is easy to read, but it is not so easy to feel. How is it with your heart this morning? Are you in the lowest depths of sorrow? Does corruption rise within your spirit, and grace seem like a poor spark trampled underfoot? Does your faith almost fail you? Fear not, it is neither your graces nor feelings on which you are to live. You must live simply by faith on Christ. With all these things against us now, in the very depths of our sorrow wherever we may be, now, as much in the valley as on the mountain. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Ah, but you say, see how I am arrayed. My graces are not bright. My righteousness does not shine with apparent glory. But read the next. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The Holy Spirit shall purify our minds, and divine power shall refine our bodies. Then shall we see him as he is. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 13th Romans chapter 8 verse 1 Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come, my soul, think thou of this. Believing in Jesus, Thou art actually and effectually cleared from guilt. Thou art led out of thy prison. Thou art no more in fetters as a bond-slave. Thou art delivered now from the bondage of the law. Thou art freed from sin, and canst walk at large as a freeman. Thy Saviour's blood has procured thy full discharge. Thou hast a right now to approach thy Father's throne. No flames of vengeance are there to scare thee now. No fiery sword. Justice cannot smite the innocent. Thy disabilities are taken away. Thou waste once unable to see thy father's face. Thou canst see it now. Thou couldst not speak with him, but now thou hast access with boldness. Once there was a fear of hell upon thee, but thou hast no fear of it now. For how can there be punishment for the guiltless? He who believeth is not condemned, and cannot be punished. And more than all, the privileges thou mightst have enjoyed, if thou hadst never sinned, are thine now that thou art justified. All the blessings which thou wouldst have had, if thou hadst kept the law, and more, are thine, because Christ has kept it for thee. 
all the love and the acceptance which perfect obedience could have obtained of God belong to thee, because Christ was perfectly obedient on thy behalf, and hath imputed all his merits to thy account, that thou mightst be exceeding rich through him, who, for thy sake, became exceeding poor. Oh, how great the debt of love and gratitude thou owest to thy Saviour! A debtor to mercy alone. Of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with thy righteousness on my person and offerings to bring the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do my Saviour's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 14th Second Kings Chapter 25, verse 30. And the king provided Jehoiakim a daily portion for the rest of his life. Jehoiakim was not sent away from the king's palace with a store to last him for months, but his provision was given him as a daily pension. Herein he well pictures the happy position of all the Lord's people. A daily portion is all that a man really wants. We do not need tomorrow's supplies. That day has not yet dawned, and its wants are as yet unborn. The thirst which we may suffer in the month of June does not need to be quenched in February, for we do not feel it yet. If we have enough for each day as the days arrive, we shall never know want. Sufficient for the day is all that we can enjoy. We cannot eat or drink or wear more than the day's supply of food and raiment. The surplus gives us the care of storing it and the anxiety of watching against a thief. One staff aids a traveller, but a bundle of staves is a heavy burden. Enough is not only as good as a feast, but is all that the greatest glutton can truly enjoy. This is all that we should expect. A craving for more than this is ungrateful. When our Father does not give us more, we should be content with His daily allowance. Jehoiakim's case is ours. We have a sure portion, a portion given us of the king, a gracious portion, and a perpetual portion. Here is surely ground for thankfulness. Beloved Christian reader, in matters of grace you need a daily supply. You have no store of strength. Day by day must you seek help from above. It is a very sweet assurance that a daily portion is provided for you in the Word, through the ministry, by meditation, in prayer, and waiting upon God, you shall receive renewed strength. In Jesus, all needful things are laid up for you. Then enjoy your continual allowance. Never go hungry while the daily bread of grace is on the table of mercy. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening February 14th. Luke chapter 8, verse 47. Then the woman, seeing that she could not escape notice, came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she explained why she had touched him and how she had immediately been healed. One of the most touching and teaching of the Savior's miracles is before us tonight. The woman was very ignorant. She imagined that virtue, came out of Christ by a law of necessity, without his knowledge or direct will. Moreover, she was a stranger to the generosity of Jesus' character, or she would not have gone behind to steal the cure, which he was so ready to bestow. Misery should always place itself right in the face of mercy. Had she known the love of Jesus' heart, she would have said, I have but to put myself where he can see me. His omniscience will teach him my case, and his love, at once, will work my cure. We admire her faith, but we marvel at her ignorance. After she had obtained the cure, she rejoiced with trembling. Glad was she that the divine virtue had wrought a marvel in her. But she feared lest Christ should retract the blessing and put a negative upon the grant of his grace. 
little did she comprehend the fullness of his love. We have not so clear a view of him as we could wish. We know not the heights and depths of his love, but we know of a surety that he is too good to withdraw from a trembling soul the gift which it has been able to obtain. But here is the marvel of it. Little as was her knowledge, her faith, because it was real faith, saved her, and saved her at once. There was no tedious delay. Faith's miracle was instantaneous. If we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, salvation is our present and eternal possession. If in the list of the Lord's children we are written as the feeblest of the family, yet, being heirs through faith, no power, human or devilish, can eject us from salvation. If we dare not lean our heads upon his bosom with John, yet if we can venture in the press behind him and touch the hem of his garment, we are made whole. Courage, timid one, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 15th 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Heaven will be full of the ceaseless praises of Jesus. Eternity! Thine unnumbered years shall speed their everlasting course, but forever and forever to Him be glory. Is He not a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? To Him be glory. Is He not King forever? King of kings and Lord of lords, the everlasting Father? To Him be glory forever. Never shall His praises cease. That which was bought with blood deserves to last while immortality endures. The glory of the cross must never be eclipsed. The luster of the grave and of the resurrection must never be dimmed. O Jesus, Thou shalt be praised forever, long as immortal spirits live, long as the Father's throne endures, forever, forever. Unto thee shall be glory. Believer, you are anticipating the time when you shall join the saints above in ascribing all glory to Jesus. But are you glorifying him now? The Apostle's words are To him be glory both now and forever. Will you not this day make it your prayer? Lord, help me to glorify thee. I am poor. Help me to glorify thee by contentment. I am sick. Help me to give thee honor by patience, I have talents. Help me to extol thee by spending them for thee, I have time. Lord, help me to redeem it that I may serve thee, I have a heart to feel. Lord, let that heart feel no love but thine, and glow with no flame but affection for thee, I have a head to think. Lord, help me to think of thee and for thee, thou hast put me in this world for something. Lord, show me what that is, and help me to work out my life purpose. I cannot do much. But, as the widow put in her two mites, which were all her living, so, Lord, I cast my time and eternity too into thy treasury. I am all thine. Take me, and enable me to glorify thee now in all that I say, in all that I do, and with all that I have. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 15th Psalm 45, verse 8 All your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces of ivory the harps make you glad. And who are thus privileged to make the Saviour glad? His church, his people. But is it possible? He makes us glad, but how can we make him glad? By our love. Ah, we think it so cold, so faint, and so indeed we must sorrowfully confess it to be, but it is very sweet to Christ. Hear his own eulogy of that love in the golden canticle. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse! How much better is thy love than wine! See, loving heart, how he delights in you! When you lean your head on his bosom, you not only receive, but you give him joy. 
When you gaze with love upon his all-glorious face, you not only obtain comfort, but impart delight. Our praise, too, gives him joy. Not the song of the lips alone, but the melody of the heart's deep gratitude. Our gifts, too, are very pleasant to him. He loves to see us lay our time, our talents, our substance upon the altar, not for the value of what we give, but for the sake of the motive from which the gift springs. To him, the lowly offerings of his saints are more acceptable than the thousands of gold and silver. Holiness is like frankincense and myrrh to him. Forgive your enemy, and you make Christ glad. Distribute of your substance to the poor, and he rejoices. Be the means of saving souls, and you give him to see of the travail of his soul. Proclaim his gospel, and you are a sweet savor unto him. Go among the ignorant and lift up the cross, and you have given him honor. It is in your power even now to break the alabaster box and pour the precious oil of joy upon his head, as did the woman of old, whose memorial is to this day set forth wherever the gospel is preached. Will you be backward then? Will you not perfume your beloved Lord with the myrrh and aloes and cassia of your heart's praise? Yes, ye ivory palaces, ye shall hear the songs of the saints. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 16th Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 I am not saying this out of need, for I have learned to be content regardless of my circumstances. These words show us that contentment is not a natural propensity of man. Ill weeds grow apace. Covetousness, discontent, and murmuring are as natural to man as thorns are to the soil. We need not sow thistles and brambles. They come up naturally enough because they are indigenous to earth. And so, we need not teach men to complain. They complain fast enough without any education. But the precious things of the earth must be cultivated. If we would have wheat, we must plow and sow. If we want flowers, there must be the garden and all the gardener's care. Now contentment is one of the flowers of heaven, and if we would have it, it must be cultivated. It will not grow in us by nature. It is the new nature alone that can produce it. And even then, we must be specially careful and watchful that we maintain and cultivate the grace which God has sown in us. Paul says, I have learned to be content. As much as to say, he did not know how at one time. It cost him some pains to attain to the mystery of that great truth. No doubt he sometimes thought he had learned, and then broke down. And when at last he had attained unto it, and could say, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content, he was an old, grey-headed man, upon the borders of the grave, a poor prisoner shut up in Nero's dungeon at Rome. We might well be willing to endure Paul's infirmities and share the cold dungeon with him if we too might by any means attain unto his good degree. Do not indulge the notion that you can be contented with learning or learn without discipline. It is not a power that may be exercised naturally, but a science to be acquired gradually. We know this from experience. Brother, hush that murmur, natural though it be, and continue a diligent pupil in the College of Content. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 16th Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 20 You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths and you gave them water for their thirst. Common, too common, is the sin of forgetting the Holy Spirit. This is folly and ingratitude. He deserves well at our hands, for He is good, supremely good. As God, 
He is good, essentially. He shares in the threefold description of holy, 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 which ascends to the triune Jehovah. Unmixed purity and truth and grace is he. He is good, benevolently, tenderly bearing with our waywardness, striving with our rebellious wills, quickening us from our death in sin, and then training us for the skies as a loving nurse fosters her child. How generous, forgiving, and tender is this patient spirit of God. He is good operatively. All his works are good in the most eminent degree. He suggests good thoughts, prompts good actions, reveals good truths, applies good promises, assists in good attainments, and leads to good results. There is no spiritual good in all the world, of which he is not the author and sustainer, and heaven itself will owe the perfect character of its redeemed inhabitants to his work. He is good officially, whether as comforter, instructor, guide, sanctifier, quickener, or intercessor. He fulfills his office well, and each work is fraught with the highest good to the church of God. They who yield to his influences become good. They who obey his impulses do good. They who live under his power receive good. Let us then act towards so good a person according to the dictates of gratitude. Let us revere his person and adore him as God over all, blessed forever. Let us own his power and our need of him by waiting upon him in all our holy enterprises. Let us hourly seek his aid and never grieve him. And let us speak to his praise whenever occasion occurs. The church will never prosper until more reverently it believes in the Holy Ghost. He is so good and kind that it is sad indeed that he should be grieved by slights and negligences. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 17th Genesis chapter 25 verse 11 After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who lived near Beer Lahai Roy. Hagar had once found deliverance there, and Ishmael had drank from the water so graciously revealed by the God who liveth and seeth the sons of men. But this was a merely casual visit, such as worldlings pay to the Lord in times of need, when it serves their turn. They cry to him in trouble, but forsake him in prosperity. Isaac dwelt there and made the well of the living and all-seeing God his constant source of supply. The usual tenor of a man's life, the dwelling of his soul, is the true test of his state. Perhaps the providential visitation experienced by Hagar struck Isaac's mind and led him to revere the place. Its mystical name endeared it to him. His frequent musings by its brim at eventide made him familiar with the well. His meeting Rebecca there had made his spirit feel at home near the spot. But best of all, the fact that he there enjoyed fellowship with the living God had made him select that hallowed ground for his dwelling. Let us learn to live in the presence of the living God. Let us pray the Holy Spirit that this day and every other day we may feel, Thou, God, seest me. May the Lord Jehovah be as a well to us, delightful, comforting, unfailing, springing up unto eternal life. The bottle of the creature cracks and dries up, but the well of the Creator never fails. Happy is he who dwells at the well, and so has abundant and constant supplies near at hand. The Lord has been a sure helper to others. His name is Shaddai, God All-Sufficient. Our hearts have often had most delightful intercourse with Him. Through Him, our soul has found her glorious husband, the Lord Jesus. And in Him, this day, we live and move and have our being. Let us, then, dwell in closest fellowship with Him. Glorious Lord, constrain us that we may never leave Thee, but dwell by the well of the living God. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 17th, Ezekiel, chapter 35, verse 10. Because you have said, 
these two nations and countries will be ours, and we will possess them. Even though the Lord was there, Edom's princes saw the whole country left desolate and counted upon its easy conquest. But there was one great difficulty in their way, quite unknown to them. The Lord was there, and in his presence lay the special security of the chosen land. Whatever may be the machinations and devices of the enemies of God's people, there is still the same effectual barrier to thwart their design. The saints are God's heritage, and he is in the midst of them, and will protect his own. What comfort this assurance yields us in our troubles and spiritual conflicts. We are constantly opposed, and yet perpetually preserved. How often Satan shoots his arrows against our faith. But our faith defies the power of hell's fiery darts. They are not only turned aside, but they are quenched upon its shield, for the Lord is there. Our good works are the subjects of Satan's attacks. A saint never yet had a virtue or a grace which was not the target for hellish bullets. Whether it was hope bright and sparkling, or love warm and fervent, or patience all enduring, or zeal flaming like coals of fire, the old enemy of everything that is good has tried to destroy it. The only reason why anything virtuous or lovely survives in us is this. The Lord is there. If the Lord be with us through life, we need not fear for our dying confidence. For when we come to die, we shall find that the Lord is there. Where the billows are most tempestuous and the water is most chill, we shall feel the bottom and know that it is good. Our feet shall stand upon the rock of ages when time is passing away. Beloved, from the first of a Christian's life to the last, the only reason why he does not perish is because the Lord is there. When the God of everlasting love shall change and leave his elect to perish, then may the church of God be destroyed. But not till then, because it is written, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 18th Job chapter 10 verse 2 I will say to God, Do not condemn me. Let me know why you prosecute me. Perhaps, O tried soul, the Lord is doing this to develop thy graces. There are some of thy graces which would never be discovered if it were not for thy trials. Dost thou not know that thy faith never looks so grand in summer weather as it does in winter? Love is too often like a glow worm, showing but little light, except it be in the midst of surrounding darkness. Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Afflictions are often the black foils in which God doth set the jewels of his children's graces, to make them shine the better. It was but a little while ago that on thy knees thou wast saying, Lord, I fear I have no faith. Let me know that I have faith. Was not this really, though perhaps unconsciously, praying for trials? For how canst thou know that thou hast faith until thy faith is exercised? Depend upon it, God often sends us trials that our graces may be discovered and that we may be certified of their existence. Besides, it is not merely discovery, real growth in grace is the result of sanctified trials. God often takes away our comforts and our privileges in order to make us better Christians. He trains his soldiers not in tents of ease and luxury, but by turning them out and using them to forced marches and hard service. He makes them ford through streams and swim through rivers and climb mountains and walk many a long mile with heavy knapsacks of sorrow on their backs. Well, Christian, may not this account for the troubles through which thou art passing? Is not the Lord bringing out your graces and making them grow? Is not this the reason why he is contending with you? Trials make the promise sweet. Trials give new life to prayer. 
trials bring me to his feet. Lay me low, and keep me there. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 18th Luke, chapter 15, verse 18 I will get up and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. It is quite certain that those whom Christ has washed in his precious blood need not make a confession of sin as culprits or criminals before God the Judge, for Christ has forever taken away all their sins in a legal sense, so that they no longer stand where they can be condemned, but are once for all accepted in the Beloved. But having become children, and offending as children, ought they not every day to go before their heavenly Father, and confess their sin, and acknowledge their iniquity in that character? Nature teaches that it is the duty of erring children to make a confession to their earthly Father, and the grace of God in the heart teaches us that we, as Christians, owe the same duty to our heavenly Father. We daily offend, and ought not to rest without daily pardon. For supposing that my trespasses against my Father are not at once taken to Him to be washed away by the cleansing power of the Lord Jesus, what will be the consequence? If I have not sought forgiveness and been washed from these offences against my Father, I shall feel at a distance from Him. I shall doubt His love to me. I shall tremble at Him. I shall be afraid to pray to him. I shall grow like the prodigal, who, although still a child, was yet far off from his father. But if, with a child's sorrow at offending so gracious and loving a parent, I go to him and tell him all, and rest not till I realize that I am forgiven, then I shall feel a holy love to my father, and shall go through my Christian career, not only as saved, but as one enjoying present peace in God, through Jesus Christ my Lord. There is a wide distinction between confessing sin as a culprit and confessing sin as a child. The Father's bosom is the place for penitent confessions. We have been cleansed once for all, but our feet still need to be washed from the defilement of our daily walk as children of God. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 19th Ezekiel Chapter 36, verse 37 This is what the Lord God says. Once again, I will hear the plea of the house of Israel, and do for them this. I will multiply their people like a flock. Prayer is the forerunner of mercy. Turn to sacred history, and you will find that scarcely ever did a great mercy come to this world unheralded by supplication. You have found this true in your own personal experience. God has given you many an unsolicited favor, but still great prayer has always been the prelude of great mercy with you. When you first found peace through the blood of the cross, you had been praying much and earnestly interceding with God that He would remove your doubts and deliver you from your distresses. Your assurance was the result of prayer. When at any time you have had high and rapturous joys, you have been obliged to look upon them as answers to your prayers. When you have had great deliverances out of sore troubles and mighty helps in great dangers, you have been able to say, I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Prayer is always the preface to blessing. It goes before the blessing as the blessing's shadow. When the sunlight of God's mercies rises upon our necessities, it casts the shadow of prayer far down upon the plain. Or, to use another illustration, when God piles up a hill of mercies, He Himself shines behind them, and He casts on our spirits the shadow of prayer, so that we may rest certain, if we are much in prayer, our pleadings are the shadows of mercy. Prayer is thus connected with the blessing to show us the value of it. If we had the blessings without asking for them, 
we should think them common things, but prayer makes our mercies more precious than diamonds. The things we ask for are precious, but we do not realize their preciousness until we have sought for them earnestly. Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw, gives exercise to faith and love, brings every blessing from above. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 19th, John chapter 1, verse 41. He responds to Brother Simon and told him, We have found Messiah, but he translated as Christ. This case is an excellent pattern of all cases where spiritual life is vigorous. As soon as a man has found Christ, he begins to find others. I will not believe that thou hast tasted of the honey of the gospel, if thou canst eat it all thyself. True grace puts an end to all spiritual monopoly. Andrew first found his own brother Simon, and then others. Relationship has a very strong demand upon our first individual efforts. Andrew, thou didst well to begin with Simon. I doubt whether there are not some Christians giving away tracts at other people's houses who would do well to give away a tract at their own, whether there are not some engaged in works of usefulness abroad who are neglecting their special sphere of usefulness at home. Thou mayest or thou mayest not be called to evangelize the people in any particular locality, but certainly thou art called to see after thine own servants, thine own kinsfolk and acquaintance. Let thy religion begin at home. Many tradesmen export their best commodities. The Christian should not. He should have all his conversation everywhere of the best savour, but let him have a care to put forth the sweetest fruit of spiritual life and testimony in his own family. When Andrew went to find his brother, he little imagined how eminent Simon would become. Simon Peter was worth ten Andrews, so far as we can gather from sacred history. And yet Andrew was instrumental in bringing him to Jesus. You may be very deficient in talent yourself, and yet you may be the means of drawing to Christ one who shall become eminent in grace and service. Ah, dear friend, you little know the possibilities which are in you. You may but speak a word to a child, and in that child there may be slumbering a noble heart which shall stir the Christian church in years to come. Andrew has only two talents, but he finds Peter. Go thou and do likewise. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 20th 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. And who comforteth like him? Go to some poor, melancholy, distressed child of God. Tell him sweet promises and whisper in his ear, choice words of comfort. He is like the deaf adder. He listens not to the voice of the charmer. Charm he never so wisely. He is drinking gall and wormwood, and comfort him as you may. It will be only a note or two of mournful resignation that you will get from him. You will bring forth no psalms of praise, no hallelujahs, no joyful sonnets. But let God come to his child. Let him lift up his countenance, and the mourner's eyes glisten with hope. Do you not hear him sing? Tis paradise if thou art here. If thou depart, tis hell. You could not have cheered him, but the Lord has done it. He is the God of all comfort. There is no balm in Gilead, but there is balm in God. There is no physician among the creatures, but the Creator is Jehovah Rophi. It is marvelous how one sweet word of God will make whole songs for Christians. One word of God is like a piece of gold, and the Christian is the gold beater, and can hammer that promise out for whole weeks. So then, poor Christian, thou needest not sit down in despair. Go to the Comforter 
and ask him to give thee consolation. Thou art a poor dry well. You have heard it said, that when a pump is dry, you must pour water down it first of all, and then you will get water. And so, Christian, when thou art dry, go to God, ask him to shed abroad his joy in thy heart, and then thy joy shall be full. Do not go to earthly acquaintances, for you will find them Job's comforters after all, but go first and foremost to thy God that comforteth those that are cast down, and you will soon say, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 20th Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. A holy character does not avert temptation. Jesus was tempted. When Satan tempts us, his sparks fall upon tinder, but in Christ's case it was like striking sparks on water, yet the enemy continued his evil work. Now, if the devil goes on striking when there is no result, how much more will he do it when he knows what inflammable stuff our hearts are made of? Though you become greatly sanctified by the Holy Ghost, expect that the great dog of hell will bark at you still. In the haunts of men we expect to be tempted, but even seclusion will not guard us from the same trial. Jesus Christ was led away from human society into the wilderness and was tempted of the devil. Solitude has its charms and its benefits, and may be useful in checking the lust of the eye and the pride of life. But the devil will follow us into the most lovely retreats. Do not suppose that it is only the worldly-minded who have dreadful thoughts and blasphemous temptations, for even spiritual-minded persons endure the same. And in the holiest position, we may suffer the darkest temptation. The utmost consecration of spirit will not ensure you against satanic temptation. Christ was consecrated through and through. It was his meat and drink to do the will of him that sent him, and yet he was tempted. Your hearts may glow with a seraphic flame of love to Jesus, and yet the devil will try to bring you down to Laodicean lukewarmness. If you will tell me when God permits a Christian to lay aside his armor, I will tell you when Satan has left off temptation. Like the old knights in wartime, we must sleep with helmet and breastplate buckled on, for the archdeceiver will seize our first unguarded hour to make us his prey. The Lord keep us watchful in all seasons and give us a final escape from the jaw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 21st Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If we can only grasp these words by faith, we have an all-conquering weapon in our hand. What doubt will not be slain by this two-edged sword? What fear is there which shall not fall smitten with a deadly wound before this arrow from the bow of God's covenant? Will not the distresses of life and the pangs of death, will not the corruptions within and the snares without, will not the trials from above and the temptations from beneath, all seem but light afflictions, when we can hide ourselves beneath the bulwark of He hath said. Yes, whether for delight in our quietude, or for strength in our conflict, He hath said must be our daily resort. And this may teach us the extreme value of searching the Scriptures. There may be a promise in the Word which would exactly fit your case but you may not know of it, and therefore you miss its comfort. You are like prisoners in a dungeon, and there may be one key in the bunch which would unlock the door, 
and you might be free. But if you will not look for it, you may remain a prisoner still, though liberty is so near at hand. There may be a potent medicine in the great pharmacopoeia of Scripture, and you may yet continue sick unless you will examine and search the Scriptures to discover what He hath said. Should you not, besides reading the Bible, store your memories richly with the promises of God? You can recollect the sayings of great men. You treasure up the verses of renowned poets. Ought you not to be profound in your knowledge of the words of God, so that you may be able to quote them readily when you would solve a difficulty or overthrow a doubt? Since, he hath said, is the source of all wisdom and the fountain of all comfort, let it dwell in you richly, as a well of water, springing up unto everlasting life. So shall you grow healthy, strong, and happy in the divine life. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 21st Acts chapter 8, verse 30 So Philip ran up and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. We should be abler teachers of others, and less liable to be carried about by every wind of doctrine if we sought to have a more intelligent understanding of the Word of God. As the Holy Ghost, the author of the Scriptures, is He who alone can enlighten us rightly to understand them, we should constantly ask His teaching and His guidance into all truth. When the prophet Daniel would interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what did he do? He set himself to earnest prayer that God would open up the vision. The Apostle John, in his vision at Patmos, saw a book sealed with seven seals, which none was found worthy to open, or so much as to look upon. The book was afterwards opened by the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who had prevailed to open it. But it is written first, I wept much. The tears of John, which were his liquid prayers, were, so far as he was concerned, the sacred keys by which the folded book was opened. Therefore, if, for your own and others profiting, you desire to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, remember that prayer is your best means of study. Like Daniel, you shall understand the dream and the interpretation thereof when you have sought unto God, and like John, you shall see the seven seals of precious truth unloosed after you have wept much. Stones are not broken, except by an earnest use of the hammer, and the stone-breaker must go down on his knees. Use the hammer of diligence, and let the knee of prayer be exercised, and there is not a stony doctrine in Revelation, which is useful for you to understand, which will not fly into shivers under the exercise of prayer and faith. You may force your way through anything with the leverage of prayer. Thoughts and reasonings are like the steel wedges which give a hold upon truth. But prayer is the lever, the prize which forces open the iron chest of sacred mystery that we may get the treasure hidden within. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 22nd Genesis chapter 49, verse 24 Yet he steadied his bow, and his strong arms were tempered by the hands of the Mighty One of Jacob, in the name of the Shepherd, the Rock of Israel. That strength which God gives to his Josephs is real strength. It is not a boasted valor, a fiction, a thing of which men talk, but which ends in smoke. It is true, divine strength. Why does Joseph stand against temptation? Because God gives him aid. There is naught that we can do without the power of God. All true strength comes from the mighty God of Jacob. Notice in what a blessedly familiar way God gives this strength to Joseph. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Thus, 
God is represented as putting his hands on Joseph's hands, placing his arms on Joseph's arms. Like as a father teaches his children, so the Lord teaches them that fear him. He puts his arms upon them. Marvelous condescension. God Almighty, eternal, omnipotent, stoops from his throne and lays his hand upon the child's hand, stretching his arm upon the arm of Joseph, that he may be made strong. This strength was also covenant strength, for it is ascribed to the mighty God of Jacob. Now, wherever you read of the God of Jacob in the Bible, you should remember the covenant with Jacob. Christians love to think of God's covenant. All the power, all the grace, all the blessings, all the mercies, all the comforts, all the things we have, flow to us from the wellhead through the covenant. If there were no covenant, then we should fail indeed, for all grace proceeds from it, as light and heat from the sun. No angels ascend or descend, save upon that ladder which Jacob saw, at the top of which stood a covenant God. Christian, it may be that the archers have sorely grieved you, and shot at you, and wounded you, but still your bow abides in strength. Be sure then to ascribe all the glory to Jacob's God. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 22nd Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3 The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Jehovah is slow to anger. When mercy cometh into the world, she driveth winged steeds. The axles of her chariot wheels are red hot with speed. But when wrath goeth forth, it toileth on with tardy footsteps. For God taketh no pleasure in the sinner's death. God's rod of mercy is ever in his hands outstretched. His sword of justice is in its scabbard held down by that pierced hand of love which bled for the sins of men. The Lord is slow to anger, because he is great in power. He is truly great in power, who hath power over himself. When God's power doth restrain himself, then it is power indeed. The power that binds omnipotence is omnipotence surpassed. A man who has a strong mind can bear to be insulted long, and only resents the wrong when a sense of right demands his action. The weak mind is irritated at a little. The strong mind bears it like a rock which moveth not, though a thousand breakers dash upon it, and cast their pitiful malice in spray upon its summit. God marketh his enemies, and yet he bestirs not himself, but holdeth in his anger. If he were less divine than he is, he would long ere this have sent forth the whole of his thunders, and emptied the magazines of heaven. He would long ere this have blasted the earth with the wondrous fires of its lower regions, and man would have been utterly destroyed. But the greatness of his power brings us mercy. Dear reader, what is your state this evening? Can you by humble faith look to Jesus and say, My substitute, thou art my rock, my trust. Then, beloved, be not afraid of God's power, for by faith you have fled to Christ for refuge. The power of God need no more terrify you than the shield and sword of the warrior need terrify those whom he loves. Rather rejoice that he who is great in power is your father and friend. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning February 23rd. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. No promise is of private interpretation. Whatever God has said to any one saint, He has said to all. When He opens a well for one, it is that all may drink. When he openeth a granary door to give out food, there may be some one starving man who is the occasion of its being opened. 
but all hungry saints may come and feed too. Whether he gave the word to Abraham or to Moses matters not, O believer. He has given it to thee as one of the covenanted seed. There is not a high blessing too lofty for thee, nor a wide mercy too extensive for thee. Lift up now thine eyes to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, for all this is thine. Climb to Pisgah's top and view the utmost limit of the divine promise, for the land is all thine own. There is not a brook of living water of which thou mayest not drink. If the land floweth with milk and honey, eat the honey and drink the milk, for both are thine. Be thou bold to believe, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. In this promise, God gives to his people everything. I will never leave thee. Then, no attribute of God can cease to be engaged for us. Is he mighty? He will show himself strong on the behalf of them that trust him. Is he love? Then, with loving kindness, will he have mercy upon us. Whatever attributes may compose the character of deity, every one of them to its fullest extent shall be engaged on our side. To put everything in one, there is nothing you can want, there is nothing you can ask for, there is nothing you can need in time or in eternity. There is nothing living, nothing dying. There is nothing in this world, nothing in the next world, there is nothing now, nothing at the resurrection, morning, nothing in heaven which is not contained in this text. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 23rd Mark, chapter 10, verse 21 Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, there is one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you own, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You have not the making of your own cross, although unbelief is a master carpenter at cross-making. Neither are you permitted to choose your own cross, although self-will would fain be lord and master. But your cross is prepared and appointed for you by divine love, and you are cheerfully to accept it. You are to take up the cross as your chosen badge and burden, and not to stand caviling at it. This night Jesus bids you submit your shoulder to his easy yoke. Do not kick at it in petulance, or trample on it in vain glory, or fall under it in despair, or run away from it in fear, but take it up like a true follower of Jesus. Jesus was a cross-bearer. He leads the way in the path of sorrow. Surely you could not desire a better guide. And if he carried a cross, what nobler burden would you desire? The Via Crucis is the way of safety. Fear not to tread its thorny paths. Beloved, the cross is not made of feathers or lined with velvet. It is heavy, and galling to disobedient shoulders. But it is not an iron cross, though your fears have painted it with iron colors. It is a wooden cross, and a man can carry it, for the man of sorrows tried the load. Take up your cross, and by the power of the Spirit of God you will soon be so in love with it, that like Moses, you would not exchange the reproach of Christ for all the treasures of Egypt. Remember that Jesus carried it, and it will smell sweetly. Remember that it will soon be followed by the crown, and the thought of the coming weight of glory will greatly lighten the present heaviness of trouble. The Lord help you to bow your spirit in submission to the divine will ere you fall asleep this night, that waking with tomorrow's sun, you may go forth to the day's cross with the holy and submissive spirit which becomes a follower of the crucified. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 24th Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 26 I will make them in the places around my hill a blessing, 
I will send down showers in season. Showers of blessing. Here is sovereign mercy. I will give them the shower in its season. Is it not sovereign divine mercy? For who can say, I will give them showers, except God? There is only one voice which can speak to the clouds and bid them beget the rain. Who sendeth down the rain upon the earth? Who scattereth the showers upon the green herb? Do not I, the Lord. So grace is the gift of God, and is not to be created by man. It is also needed grace. What would the ground do without showers? You may break the clods, you may sow your seeds. But what can you do without the rain? As absolutely needful is the divine blessing. In vain you labor, until God the plenteous shower bestows and sends salvation down. Then it is plenteous grace. I will send them showers. It does not say, I will send them drops, but showers. So it is with grace. If God gives a blessing, He usually gives it in such a measure that there is not room enough to receive it. Plenteous grace. Ah, we want plenteous grace to keep us humble, to make us prayerful, to make us holy. Plenteous grace to make us zealous, to preserve us through this life, and, at last, to land us in heaven. We cannot do without saturating showers of grace. Again, it is seasonable grace. I will cause the shower to come down in his season. What is thy season this morning? Is it the season of drought? Then that is the season for showers. Is it a season of great heaviness and black clouds? Then that is the season for showers. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. And here is a varied blessing. I will give thee showers of blessing. The word is in the plural. All kinds of blessings God will send. All God's blessings go together, like links in a golden chain. If he gives converting grace, he will also give comforting grace. He will send showers of blessing. Look up today, O parched plant, and open thy leaves and flowers for a heavenly watering. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 24th Zechariah, chapter 1, verse 12, 13 Zzz! What a sweet answer to an anxious inquiry! This night let us rejoice in it. O Zion, there are good things in store for thee. Thy time of travail shall soon be over. Thy children shall be brought forth. Thy captivity shall end. Bear patiently the rod for a season, and under the darkness still trust in God, for his love burneth towards thee. God loves the church with a love too deep for human imagination. He loves her with all his infinite heart. Therefore, let her sons be of good courage. She cannot be far from prosperity, to whom God speaketh good words and comfortable words. What these comfortable words are, the prophet goes on to tell us, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. The Lord loves his church so much that he cannot bear that she should go astray to others. And when she has done so, he cannot endure that she should suffer too much or too heavily. He will not have his enemies afflict her. He is displeased with them, because they increase her misery. When God seems most to leave his church, his heart is warm towards her. History shows that whenever God uses a rod to chasten his servants, he always breaks it afterwards, as if he loathed the rod which gave his children pain. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. God hath not forgotten us because he smites. His blows are no evidences of want of love. If this is true of his church collectively, it is of necessity true also of each individual member. You may fear that the Lord has passed you by, but it is not so. He who counts the stars and calls them by their names is in no danger of forgetting his own children. 
He knows your case as thoroughly as if you were the only creature he ever made, or the only saint he ever loved. Approach him and be at peace. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 25th Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his place of baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. It is pleasant to pass over a country after a storm has spent itself, to smell the freshness of the herbs after the rain has passed away, and to note the drops while they glisten like purest diamonds in the sunlight. That is the position of a Christian. He is going through a land where the storm has spent itself upon his Saviour's head, and if there be a few drops of sorrow falling, they distill from clouds of mercy, and Jesus cheers him by the assurance that they are not for his destruction. But how terrible is it to witness the approach of a tempest, to note the forewarnings of the storm, to mark the birds of heaven as they droop their wings, to see the cattle as they lay their heads low in terror, to discern the face of the sky as it groweth black, and look to the sun which shineth not, and the heavens which are angry and frowning. How terrible to await the dread advance of a hurricane, such as occurs sometimes in the tropics, to wait in terrible apprehension till the wind shall rush forth in fury tearing up trees from their roots, forcing rocks from their pedestals, and hurling down all the dwelling places of man. And yet, sinner, this is your present position. No hot drops have as yet fallen, but a shower of fire is coming. No terrible winds howl around you, but God's tempest is gathering its dread artillery. As yet the water floods are dammed up by mercy, but the floodgates shall soon be opened. The thunderbolts of God are yet in his storehouse, but, lo, the tempest hastens. And how awful shall that moment be when God, robed in vengeance, shall march forth in fury. Where, 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 O sinner, wilt thou hide thy head, or whither wilt thou flee? O that the hand of mercy may now lead you to Christ. He is freely set before you in the gospel. His riven side is the rock of shelter. Thou knowest thy need of him. Believe in him, cast thyself upon him, and then the fury shall be overpassed forever. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 25th Jonah, chapter 1, verse 3 Jonah, however, got up to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship bound for Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went aboard to sail for Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Instead of going to Nineveh to preach the word, as God bade him, Jonah disliked the work and went down to Joppa to escape from it. There are occasions when God's servants shrink from duty. But what is the consequence? What did Jonah lose by his conduct? He lost the presence and comfortable enjoyment of God's love. When we serve our Lord Jesus as believers should do, our God is with us. And though we have the whole world against us, if we have God with us, what does it matter? But the moment we start back and seek our own inventions, we are at sea without a pilot. Then may we bitterly lament and groan out, O oh my God, where hast thou gone? How could I have been so foolish as to shun thy service? and in this way to lose all the bright shinings of thy face. This is a price too high. Let me return to my allegiance, that I may rejoice in thy presence. In the next place, Jonah lost all peace of mind. Sin soon destroys a believer's comfort. It is the poisonous upas tree, from whose leaves distill deadly drops, which destroy the life of joy and peace. Jonah lost everything upon which he might have drawn for comfort in any other case. He could not plead the promise of divine protection, 
for he was not in God's ways. He could not say, Lord, I meet with these difficulties in the discharge of my duty. Therefore help me through them. He was reaping his own deeds. He was filled with his own ways. Christian, do not play the Jonah unless you wish to have all the waves and the billows rolling over your head. You will find in the long run that it is far harder to shun the work and will of God than to at once yield yourself to it. Jonah lost his time, for he had to go to Nineveh after all. It is hard to contend with God. Let us yield ourselves at once. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 26th Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9 But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. Salvation is the work of God. It is He alone who quickens the soul, dead in trespasses and sins, and it is He also who maintains the soul in its spiritual life. He is both Alpha and Omega. Salvation is of the Lord. If I am prayerful, God makes me prayerful. If I have graces, they are God's gifts to me. If I hold on in a consistent life, it is because He upholds me with His hand. I do nothing whatever towards my own preservation, except what God Himself first does in me. Whatever I have, all my goodness is of the Lord alone. Wherein I sin, that is my own. But wherein I act rightly, that is of God, wholly and completely. If I have repulsed a spiritual enemy, the Lord's strength nerved my arm. Do I live before men a consecrated life? It is not I but Christ who liveth in me. Am I sanctified? I did not cleanse myself. God's Holy Spirit sanctifies me. Am I weaned from the world? I am weaned by God's chastisements, sanctified to my good. Do I grow in knowledge? The great instructor teaches me. All my jewels were fashioned by heavenly art. I find in God all that I want, but I find in myself nothing but sin, and misery. He only is my rock and my salvation. Do I feed on the Word? That Word would be no food for me unless the Lord made it food for my soul and helped me to feed upon it. Do I live on the manna which comes down from heaven? What is that manna but Jesus Christ Himself incarnate, whose body and whose blood I eat and drink? Am I continually receiving fresh increase of strength? Where do I gather my might? My help cometh from heaven's hills. Without Jesus, I can do nothing. As a branch cannot bring forth fruit except it abide in the vine, no more can I, except I abide in Him. What Jonah learned in the great deep, let me learn this morning in my closet. Salvation is of the Lord. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 26 Leviticus chapter 13 verse 13 The priest shall examine him, and if the disease has covered his entire body, he is to pronounce the infected person clean. Since it has all turned white, he is clean. Strange enough this regulation appears, Yet there was wisdom in it, for the throwing out of the disease proved that the constitution was sound. This evening it may be well for us to see the typical teaching of so singular a rule. We, too, are lepers, and may read the law of the leper as applicable to ourselves. When a man sees himself to be altogether lost and ruined, covered all over with the defilement of sin, and in no part free from pollution, when he disclaims all righteousness of his own and pleads guilty before the Lord, then he is clean through the blood of Jesus and the grace of God. Hidden, unfelt, unconfessed iniquity is the true leprosy. But when sin is seen and felt, it has received its death blow, and the Lord looks with eyes of mercy upon the soul afflicted with it. Nothing is more deadly than self-righteousness. 
or more hopeful than contrition. We must confess that we are nothing else but sin, for no confession short of this will be the whole truth. And if the Holy Spirit be at work with us, convincing us of sin, there will be no difficulty about making such an acknowledgement. It will spring spontaneously from our lips. What comfort does the text afford to truly awakened sinners? The very circumstance which so grievously discouraged them is here turned into a sign and symptom of a hopeful state. Stripping comes before clothing. Digging out the foundation is the first thing in building, and a thorough sense of sin is one of the earliest works of grace in the heart. O thou poor, leprous sinner, utterly destitute of a sound spot, take heart from the text, and come as thou art to Jesus. For let our debts be what they may, however great or small. As soon as we have naught to pay, our Lord forgives us all. Tis perfect poverty alone that sets the soul at large. While we can call one might our own, we have no full discharge. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 27th Psalm 91, verse 9 Because you have made the Lord your dwelling, my refuge, the Most High. The Israelites in the wilderness were continually exposed to change. Whenever the pillar stayed its motion, the tents were pitched. But tomorrow, ere the morning sun had risen, the trumpet sounded, the ark was in motion, and the fiery, cloudy pillar was leading the way through the narrow defiles of the mountain, up the hillside, or along the arid waste of the wilderness. They had scarcely time to rest a little before they heard the sound of, Away! This is not your rest! You must still be onward, journeying towards Canaan. They were never long in one place. Even wells and palm trees could not detain them. Yet they had an abiding home in their God. His cloudy pillar was their roof tree, and its flame by night, their household fire. They must go onward from place to place, continually changing, never having time to settle and to say, Now we are secure. In this place we shall dwell. Yet, says Moses, Though we are always changing, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place throughout all generations. The Christian knows no change with regard to God. He may be rich today and poor tomorrow. He may be sickly today and well tomorrow. He may be in happiness today. Tomorrow he may be distressed. But there is no change with regard to his relationship to God. If he loved me yesterday, he loves me today. My unmoving mansion of rest is my blessed Lord. Let prospects be blighted, let hopes be blasted, let joy be withered, let mildews destroy everything. I have lost nothing of what I have in God. He is my strong habitation, whereunto I can continually resort. I am a pilgrim in the world, but at home in my God. In the earth I wander, but in God I dwell in a quiet habitation. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 27th Micah, chapter 5, verse 2 But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come forth for me, one to be ruler over Israel, one whose origins are of old, from the days of eternity. The Lord Jesus had goings forth for his people as their representative before the throne, long before they appeared upon the stage of time. It was from everlasting that he signed the compact with his father, that he would pay blood for blood, suffering for suffering, agony for agony, and death for death, in the behalf of his people. It was from everlasting that he gave himself up without a murmuring word, that from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot he might sweat great drops of blood, that he might be spit upon, pierced, mocked, rent asunder, and crushed beneath the pains of death. His goings forth as our surety were from everlasting. Pause, my soul, and wonder. 
Thou hast goings forth in the person of Jesus from everlasting. Not only when thou wast born into the world did Christ love thee, but his delights were with the sons of men before there were any sons of men. Often did he think of them. From everlasting to everlasting he had set his affection upon them. What? My soul! Has he been so long about thy salvation? And will not he accomplish it? Has he from everlasting been going forth to save me? And will he lose me now? What? Has he carried me in his hand as his precious jewel? And will he now let me slip from between his fingers? Did he choose me before the mountains were brought forth, or the channels of the deep were digged, and will he reject me now? Impossible! I am sure he would not have loved me so long if he had not been a changeless lover. If he could grow weary of me, he would have been tired of me long before now. If he had not loved me with a love as deep as hell and as strong as death, he would have turned from me long ago. O oh, joy above all joys, to know that I am his everlasting and inalienable inheritance, given to him by his Father or ever the earth was. Everlasting love shall be the pillow for my head this night. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 28th Psalm 62, verse 5 Rest in God alone, O my soul, for my hope comes from Him. It is the believer's privilege to use this language. If he is looking for aught from the world, it is a poor expectation, indeed. But if he looks to God for the supply of his wants, whether in temporal or spiritual blessings, his expectation will not be a vain one. Constantly he may draw from the bank of faith and get his need supplied out of the riches of God's loving kindness. This I know. I had rather have God for my banker than all the Rothschilds. My Lord never fails to honor his promises. And when we bring them to his throne, he never sends them back unanswered. Therefore, I will wait only at his door, for he ever opens it with the hand of munificent grace. At this hour, I will try him anew. But we have expectations beyond this life. We shall die soon, and then our expectation is from him. Do we not expect that when we lie upon the bed of sickness, he will send angels to carry us to his bosom? We believe that when the pulse is faint and the heart heaves heavily, some angelic messenger shall stand and look with loving eyes upon us and whisper, Sister Spirit, come away. As we approach the heavenly gate, we expect to hear the welcome invitation, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We are expecting harps of gold and crowns of glory. We are hoping soon to be amongst the multitude of shining ones before the throne. We are looking forward and longing for the time when we shall be like our glorious Lord, for we shall see him as he is. Then, if these be thine, expectations, O my soul. Live for God. Live with the desire and resolve to glorify Him, from whom cometh all thy supplies, and of whose grace in thy election, redemption and calling, it is that thou hast any expectation of coming glory. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 28th 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 16. The jar of flour was not exhausted, and the jug of oil did not run dry, according to the word that the Lord had spoken through Elijah. See the faithfulness of divine love. You observe that this woman had daily necessities. She had herself and her son to feed in a time of famine. And now, in addition, the prophet Elijah was to be fed too. But though the need was threefold, yet the supply of meal wasted not, for she had a constant supply. Each day she made calls upon the barrel, but yet each day it remained the same. 
you, dear reader, have daily necessities, and because they come so frequently, you are apt to fear that the barrel of meal will one day be empty, and the cruise of oil will fail you. Rest assured that, according to the word of God, this shall not be the case. Each day, though it bring its trouble, shall bring its help. And though you should live to outnumber the years of Methuselah, and though your needs should be as many as the sands of the seashore, yet shall God's grace and mercy last through all your necessities, and you shall never know a real lack. For three long years, in this widow's days, the heavens never saw a cloud, and the stars never wept a holy tear of dew upon the wicked earth. Famine and desolation and death made the land a howling wilderness, but this woman never was hungry, but always joyful in abundance. So shall it be with you. You shall see the sinner's hope perish, for he trusts his native strength. You shall see the proud Pharisee's confidence totter, for he builds his hope upon the sand. You shall see even your own schemes blasted and withered, but you yourself shall find that your place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Your bread shall be given you, and your water shall be sure. Better have God for your guardian than the Bank of England for your possession. You might spend the wealth of the Indies, but the infinite riches of God you can never exhaust. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, February 29th Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 3 The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you with loving devotion. The thunders of the law and the terrors of judgment are all used to bring us to Christ. But the final victory is effected by loving kindness. The prodigal set out to his father's house from a sense of need. But his father saw him a great way off and ran to meet him, so that the last steps he took towards his father's house were with the kiss still warm upon his cheek and the welcome still musical in his ears. Law and terrors do but harden. All the while they work alone. But a sense of blood-bought pardon will dissolve a heart of stone. The master came one night to the door and knocked with the iron hand of the law. The door shook and trembled upon its hinges. But the man piled every piece of furniture which he could find against the door, for he said, I will not admit the man. The master turned away, but by and by he came back, and with his own soft hand using most that part where the nail had penetrated, he knocked again, oh, so softly and tenderly. This time the door did not shake, but strange to say, it opened, and there upon his knees the once unwilling host was found rejoicing to receive his guest. Come in, come in, thou hast so knocked that my bowels are moved for thee. I could not think of thy pierced hand, leaving its blood mark on my door and of thy going away houseless, thy head filled with dew, and thy locks with the drops of the night. I yield, I yield, thy love has won my heart. So in every case, loving kindness wins the day. What Moses with the tablets of stone could never do, Christ does with his pierced hand. Such is the doctrine of effectual calling. Do I understand it experimentally? Can I say, he drew me, and I followed on, glad to confess the voice divine. If so, may he continue to draw me, till at last I shall sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, February 29th 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Dear reader, have you received the Spirit which is of God, 
wrought by the Holy Ghost in your soul? The necessity of the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart may be clearly seen from this fact, that all which has been done by God the Father and by God the Son must be ineffectual to us unless the Spirit shall reveal these things to our souls. What effect does the doctrine of election have upon any man until the Spirit of God enters into him? Election is a dead letter in my consciousness until the Spirit of God calls me out of darkness into marvelous light. Then, through my calling, I see my election, and knowing myself to be called of God, I know myself to have been chosen in the eternal purpose. A covenant was made with the Lord Jesus Christ by His Father, but what avails that covenant to us until the Holy Spirit brings us its blessings and opens our hearts to receive them? There hang the blessings on the nail, Christ Jesus, but being short of stature, we cannot reach them. The Spirit of God takes them down and hands them to us, and thus they become actually ours. Covenant blessings in themselves are like the manna in the skies, far out of mortal reach. But the Spirit of God opens the windows of heaven and scatters the living bread around the camp of the spiritual Israel. Christ's finished work is like wine stored in the wine vat. Through unbelief, we can neither draw nor drink. The Holy Spirit dips our vessel into this precious wine, and then we drink. But without the Spirit, we are as truly dead in sin as though the Father never had elected, and though the Son had never bought us with His blood. The Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary to our well-being. Let us walk lovingly towards Him and tremble at the thought of grieving Him.